Can God really be trusted? Do you believe in the greatness and goodness of God no matter what comes in your life? Is it reasonable for you to have faith in someone you've never seen? What about those times or seasons in your life when your faith wobbles or weakens, when your faith is feeble, when it's frail, when it's failing? And why is you believing in God and me putting my trust in the Lord so important? Why is it vital that we put our trust in the triune God? Faith. A faith is our topic this morning. Uh, our title today is it's about faith. That's the title. It's about faith. And uh, I hope today you'll see that faith is, uh, really, it's an issue all around us. Uh, books, films, television. Uh, I have a, a few favorite types of shows on TV. You know that I like sports. By the way, did any of you see the Maple Leafs game last night? King, I know you'll be watching, uh, and it was quite a wild game, to say the least. Uh, I also like the news, although these days I find it very disturbing, and I hope with me our prayers are for the people in the Ukraine. It's a terrible situation. I like Jeopardy. I really like Jeopardy, especially when I do well in it. Um, <laughs> I, I like murder mysteries. Heather's a bit concerned about that, um, but whether it's Dateline, 2020, 48 Hours, I like them all. And maybe a bit of a surprise to you, but I really enjoy those survivalist shows, like Life Beyond Zero, The Next Generation. An individual or a couple who are living off the grid, way, way up north in a remote cabin. Now, it's a surprise because you know that I don't like cold, I don't like snow, I don't like the winter. I don't like the idea of having to hunt for your food. Um, to me, I would hunt for a microwave frozen dinner, I'm not sure how many I would find out in the wilderness, but uh, that's my idea of hunting. Um, I like toilets that flush. I'm not an out, uh, outhouse kind of guy. Uh, and then, as you know, I have very minimal um, handyman skills. And most survivalists, most people living off the grid, have some kind of ability, some kind of skill in that way. But I must be living vicariously because I do enjoy those kinds of programs. And the other evening, there was an episode of Life uh, Below Zero, and a young couple were uh, drilling for a well. And when I say drilling, they had this big pool, and the idea was they were going to plunge it down as deep as they could. And it came to some permafrost, and they could not hammer or pushed this pull down, pull down and uh, ended up that uh, the husband had an idea. So he, typical outdoors guy, cut down a couple of trees. He made this structure. He just happened to have a pulley and a big rope. So he attached the pulley to the structure and uh, on the pulley was a log and this heavy log they used to pound down that pole uh, deep into the, the ground. The, the wife looked into the camera, looked at viewers like me and said, I know it doesn't look possible, but I have faith in him. 
And sure enough, a few minutes later, the pole went through the permafrost. There was some spring water from under that ground and uh, they were able to utilize their hand pumped well. That phrase stood out to me, I have faith in him. Faith, we see it on television, we see it in the movies, we see it in song. Hey, did you know that ABBA, do you remember the group ABBA? Well, at long last, they've been nominated for a Grammy Award in 2022. I couldn't believe it. In fact, I said, Mamma Mia, when I thought that ABBA had never been nominated for a Grammy Award in their 48 years of existence. But they're nominated for a song entitled, I Still Have Faith in You. And thinking of songs and faith, hey, did you know I heard that Sting is going to be in concert right here in London this summer? I did not get the message in a bottle, but I got it from the newspaper yesterday that advertised that Sting would be in town. One of my favorite Sting songs that won the Grammy Award for Song of the Year almost 25 years ago is a song entitled, If I Ever Lose My Faith in You. I would argue it's one of the best melodies for a song that I've ever heard. It's actually quite brilliantly composed. But the lyrics are quite compelling. Sting in the song talks about what he's lost faith in. Uh, he's lost faith in science, progress, the Holy Church. He's lost faith in politicians and the media. I actually think that his song written almost 25 years ago uh, still has relevancy for a lot of people today. But there is hope in the song because he talks about those more certain things that he doesn't think he'll ever lose faith in. Now, he does admit that it might be self, but acknowledges for a lot of people, it's God. If I ever lose my faith in God, life isn't worth living, not worth going forward. I think of uh, a funeral that we were at on Friday, a double funeral. Heather's aunt and uncle uh, both died within a month of each other, and the funeral celebration was this past Friday in Cambridge, Ontario. It was a beautiful service, and in the service, uh, Pastor Adams several times in his message talked about faith. In fact, I was counting up the number of times he used the word faith, and after 15 times, I gave up. And thinking of people who have died recently, a uh, well-known cardiologist here in London. He died. Uh, some of you know him. Uh, longtime leader up at North Park Community Church. And I was struck by the obituary because the obituary described it this way. They said the family is comforted because his faith in the Lord is realized. And I've never heard it put that way. I've heard people say, oh, the person has passed on or he's been promoted to glory. But that struck me. His faith in the Lord is realized. I thought of that hymn, It is well with my soul. Do you remember the third verse? Oh, Lord, haste that day when our faith shall be sight. And that's the glorious promise that we have as people of faith. Well, all this brings us to Abraham. Abraham says of Abraham in scripture that he was a man of faith. Several times he is called the father of our faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, Abram is listed as a superstar of faith. But it intrigues me if we were to consider a graph of uh, Abraham's faith. Uh, 
And on this graph, you can see Abraham, uh, and, and, and you see this graph. I've got two axes. You've got the faith that is going vertically and spiritual, the spiritual journey that goes horizontally. Now, there's some people who, when they start their life of faith, they're kind of at a high point. And as you can see, that top line, it just seems to stay slow and steady. There never seems to be any dips or valleys. I've actually met a couple of people like that in my lifetime, and, and they're sincere. Uh, I admire that. And then for a lot of us, it's that model that if you can tell it's the green line, that it goes in a 45-degree angle. You know, it kind of starts uh, slow, uh, and then as you move further along the uh, spiritual journey, uh, the uh, faith of that individual increases and grows. Kind of that beautiful 45-degree angle. But then you have the red line. It's kind of like uh, connecting chicken pox, uh, or as I like to call it, a roller coast. There's high points and there's valleys. There's the ups and downs when it comes to the correlation between faith and the spiritual journey. I would submit to you that Abraham, known as a man of faith, Abraham, known as the father of our faith, Abraham, acknowledged as a superstar of faith, his life is more represented graphically by that wobbly line. Ups and downs, high points, and low points. And I think that's why so many of us identify with Abraham. Now just a couple of observations before we get into our short text today. Uh, when it comes to what I call saving faith, there's been a long-term debate. Is it about a point in time or is it a process? Some of you can say, I have a point in time in my personal history when I became a believer in Jesus Christ. Others of you, and I know this, would say, I'm not as clear. It seems to have been a series of events, maybe more like a process. Now, I got to tell you, from what I understand of the work of the Holy Spirit in conversion or regeneration... I would submit that it's actually, from God's perspective, a blend of both. I don't think that I am misleading you. I do believe there's a point in time where someone passes from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But for all of us, I think it's important to see uh, saving faith and faith itself as a process. Because it's why I believe a danger we have, especially as evangelicals, is that we can be so focused on the moment of what we call saving faith that we fail to appreciate that faith is more than just a moment. Faith is a lifetime. Faith becomes a way of life. So do you see the connection I'm trying to make? Real, genuine, saving faith is a lifestyle. It is a way of life. And if we make too sharp a distinction, it's as if we're saying, oh, I put my faith in Jesus 30 years ago as something that's very kind of nostalgic. We believe in Jesus. We believe in our triune God day to day. It's our experience as believers. Now, don't get me wrong. We are all over the faith spectrum. Some way, someone may be listening today. You stumbled across this broadcast and uh, you have yet to put your faith in the Lord. I hope you'll listen in and I hope you'll stick with us because I believe there's a message for you. In reality, there's a lot of us listening today, some who are here, some are watching on YouTube, and, and your experience is you are a person of faith. 
Abraham likely put his faith in the Lord sometime back in the Ur of the Chaldeans when he made the decision to follow the Lord's direction and go to Canaan. That's what I believe was the start of his faith. But Abram, given the ups and downs of his spiritual journey, um, in this text especially, needs some reassurance. He needs refreshing. He needs to see his faith reignited, strengthened, and he needs encouragement. And frankly, that's where I believe a lot of us can find ourselves in the seasons of life. So while Genesis 15, the first few verses, look at a particular person and situation, I do believe there is a more generalized application for all of us. So with this being said, if you've got your Bible, if you've got your uh, cell phone and you can go to the app, we're only going to look at the first six verses of Genesis 15 today. We'll complete the chapter next weekend. Genesis 15 and verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am, sorry, uh, your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to Abram, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. God took Abram outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if you indeed can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. Just a very simple outline. I know some of you like that structure. So my simple outline is what I call the three D's. Uh, these are faith challenges. And we're going to weave through these three Ds the idea of divine reassurance. And then we're going to look at Genesis 15, 6, which has been called perhaps the most important verse in the Old Testament, what I'm calling the defining principle. So the three Ds the divine reassurance, and the defining principle. So let's start with what I call these faith challenges. We're going to start with one of the things that can uh, really uh, take a hit on our faith, uh, and that is dread. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, do not be afraid, Abraham. Now, the word came to Abraham in a vision, and I know many of us are curious about visions and dreams. I had quite a dream last night. I dreamed that somebody gave me a $3,000 watch. Um, if, if you got a $3,000 watch to give me, you could fulfill that dream, but I have no idea. I don't even wear a watch, so I have no idea why that was part of my dream. But I want to say this, I do believe that God can still speak through dreams and visions. However, the focus in verse 1 is that the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. And the reality is there's greater focus in verse 1 on the word coming to Abraham than what he saw in the vision. Did you get that? Um, Abram didn't have the word of God like we have it. And I will always submit to you that God's preferred way of communicating his ways, his purposes, his intentions with us is through his holy word where he reveals his purposes and will to us. Oh, he can communicate to us through uh, spiritual counsel, uh, through our friends, through circumstances, 
We're going to see another way he communicates to us in a few moments. But God spoke to Abraham. And we're told it was after this. After what? Well, that points us back to chapter 14. And you recall over the last couple of weeks what happened in Genesis 14, how Abraham rescued Lot. And Abraham won an incredible battle against uh, four bad guys. Um, and he also uh, was able to rescue some other bad guys who uh, were uh, responsible for a lot. But in the process, if you remember last week, Abraham refused to take the offer that the king of Sodom uh, rendered to him. Here's the point. Abraham has moved from being a hero, and he was a hero back in chapter 14. Uh, in his culture, he was regarded as the king of kings with that military conquest. But he had quickly moved from being a hero to a target. Kind of like the Ukrainian president is right now. He acknowledges that he's a target. Well, it's like Abram's got a big bullseye on his back. He's got a lot of kingdoms. He's come to their attention. Watch out. Let's try to remove this Abraham guy. And also, of course, he's offended uh, the evil king of Sodom who may be seeking some kind of retaliation. So I'm prepared to say that Abraham was scared. He, he may be put on a bold face, but I think this is how and why God intervenes in this conversation, in this dialogue with Abraham. Abraham, do not be afraid. You know, you've heard me say it many, many times. The number one command in all of Scripture, love one another is way up there, but the number one command is do not fear. Do not be afraid. And then I want you to notice this divine uh, reassurance. God says to Abraham, I am your shield. Now, this is a popular image in the Old Testament. David loved it. Uh, Psalm 3, verse 3. Uh, Psalm 28, verse 7. Psalm 91, verse 4, refers to the Lord being our shield, our defender, our protector. I think of Game of Thrones. I think of Lord of the Rings, all these big, massive shields that protect a warrior that protect a fighter. God says, I am your shield. I am the one who is going to protect you from the enemy. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be panicked. You don't need to live in fear and anxiety. I've got you. I've got you protected. We see shields everywhere. It was interesting. On Tuesday, Unfortunately, I had to go to urgent care at St. Joe's. I received excellent attention, I must add. But uh, when I entered, uh, I was wearing a mask, and I was given a mask to put on. So I took the mask. I thought, oh, this is an interesting way to hand me a mask. And, of course, here I am trying to take this mask out of what I thought was the packaging. And the poor young guy is looking at me like I've got three heads, uh, you're wondering why I, you may think, John, you're being too harsh on yourself about your handyman assembling abilities. Well, this just confirms my uh, lack of ability. So here I am trying to get this out, and finally he says, sir, um, that's uh, a face shield. Uh, we, we want to encourage you to wear it. And I did, and I thought, oh, it's kind of neat, eh? a face shield that's extra protection against this uh, enemy, this uh, uh, COVID virus. Uh, some of you maybe have welded and you've got a face shield. Uh, athletes wear, often wear some kind of shield. But what a promise. God is our shield. And then you will notice that I went with the footnote rendition of the end of verse 1. In my footnote it says, uh, a, gr a great reward uh, will be given to you. Um, both renditions are permissible in the Hebrew, but I think the footnote for me uh, is a better context in terms of what's said next. Um, 
because it prompts Abraham to deal with a, a, another challenge. He's dealt with the dread. Now it's doubt. And here you see this kind of reassurance from the Lord has triggered another thing that Abraham's very worried and concerned about. Years previous, the Lord had promised descendants for Abraham. And I'm sure that Abraham was eager to, uh, to be the recipient of that reward. But he had been waiting, and we see this element of doubt creeping in. You know, he had questions and concerns for God. Now, we deal in a life full of riddles, don't we? Anita, the other night, uh, was in doing her custodial work, and uh, in her report included a little riddle for me. And uh, this is a good one. It's, I'm the rare case when today comes before yesterday. What am I? And I have to admit to you, I thought, well, we're near the end of February. It has maybe something to do with leap year. And I became very philosophical about the answer to this riddle. I'm the rare case when today comes before yesterday. Well, the answer off in the little corner is, I'm a dictionary. <laughs> Blame Anita. But you and I know that often we deal with more serious riddles in life. And for Abraham, this was a concern. This, this kind of sparked some doubts for Abraham. Now, way back last year, in, a series, in our Easter weekend services, I, I did a sermon called uh, No Doubt. And... Uh, with humility, I would recommend you listen to it. I've listened to it a couple of times, and I do think it's a good sermon, and I think it outlines just a lot of aspects about doubt. I've always found doubt an intriguing subject, and I am one who believes that sincere doubt and Christian faith can coexist. And I don't say that to offend anyone. Uh, some make a distinction between uh, doubt and unbelief. I get it, but I think a better distinction in my studies is between healthy doubt and unhealthy doubt. Healthy doubt is when you have legitimate concerns and questions, but you attempt to resolve those doubts and questions. And the idea is in the process there is a strengthening of your faith. You still may have some questions and, and concerns, but your faith has been strengthened in the process. Unhealthy doubt is when a person refuses to resolve those doubts and in almost a stubborn way lands on unbelief and a resistance to God. Uh, back a year ago, I said that uh, one of the heroes of faith for me uh, was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham has regularly said that he struggled with questions and concerns and doubts in his spiritual journey. But the breakthrough for him was coming to the point where he said, I'm going to make a choice. I will choose believing in God over my doubts, questions, and concerns. And I... I think that's a choice we all need to make. I, I'm not saying you put your brain in neutral because I believe uh, faith in the Lord is always reasonable. We're not dealing with absolute proof. Push me philosophically. I don't believe in the concept of absolute proof anyways. Do I believe in reasonable proof? Yes. And I believe that it is reasonable to put one's faith in the Lord. So here we see then Abraham's dilemma. His dilemma is uh, that it's not his own flesh and blood, but uh, this, this fellow named uh, Eleazar. Now, it's kind of unusual here. This was kind of a, a, a custom, a social custom back then. 
where if you didn't have a child, you would kind of adopt a child. But it wasn't a close relationship. Um, it, it, it was kind of a legal transaction. And Abraham recognized this, and I don't believe he treated this young fellow poorly, but it was disappointing to him. And, and this caused all these doubts. Lord, you've promised you're going to do this, but, but I don't see that happening. And it's why I, I, I'll kind of throw the, three D, the third D in. So you've got, uh, how did I start? Dread. You then looked at doubt. Then you've got this area of delay. I mean, Abraham and Sarah had waited a long time for a child. Uh, do you, are you ever frustrated with God's timing? Sometimes we believe that God is moving too fast. But my guess is most of us, our complaint is God is moving way too slow. And I'm sure that's how Abraham felt. Like, God, what's taking you? You gave me this promise at 75. I'm not getting any younger. In fact, by the time uh, we're going to discover that Abraham and Sarah had a child, uh, Paul in Romans said, Abraham was as good as dead. Uh, not a way you want to think of old age, but um, quite, a, quite a vivid way of describing it. So Abraham was frustrated with this idea. And, and most of us don't like waiting. Um, even on Tuesday, though I had a pleasant experience, there's in hospitals and other places these waiting rooms. I don't know too many people who say they really super enjoy a waiting room experience. If you say, I'm looking forward to next week because I get to spend five or six hours in a waiting room, part of me says you need to get a life uh, because we just don't like that. We don't enjoy it. I actually have a proposal that uh, hospitals and other places change the name of a waiting room. I think that would do wonders. Change it to the fun room. Can you just wait over here, uh, spend some time, the doctor will see you as, as you're sitting in the fun room. Or maybe a reflection room. I even thought of an entertainment room. Now they've, in recent years, put televisions in waiting rooms. Maybe they could have a magician. Maybe they could hire a comedian. Uh, Anita, maybe you could uh, come up with some more riddles and you could uh, spend time entertaining those in the so-called waiting rooms. But on a serious note, I know some of you currently are in God's waiting room. And you're contending, as Abraham was waiting for fulfillment of promise, you're saying, Lord, you've made some wonderful promises to me. All things work out for the good. So why am I dealing with this? Why is my family dealing with this? Lord, you've said that you've got a future and a hope for me, but I don't see that happening. Why am I stuck? Why does life seem to not move for me? Or here's a big one. Lord, you've promised that if we ask, it will be given to us that we don't have because we don't ask. And yet, I've been praying for the salvation of that friend. I've been praying for that member of my family regularly and tenaciously, day after day, week after week. It's hard to wait, isn't it? And I need to give you a little aside here. We're going to see how the Lord intervenes but guess what? Abraham has some more waiting to do. Abraham is going to be waiting for a very long time for the promise of this son to come to him. But just look at how the Lord uh, gives him some reassurance very quickly here. We read that uh, God uh, gives some a further revelation. He had been promised, uh, Abram, that he would have descendants. Now, very specifically, you will have flesh and blood. And it's interesting, isn't it, that because of the doubt and the delay, um, Abraham had jumped to some wrong conclusions, and we always do that. Maybe it's part of what we see in Scripture, I like to call it the Elijah syndrome, where you go from a real high, 
Abraham had experienced the victory of Genesis 14, uh, gets into Genesis 15, and he's then plagued with dread and, and doubt in that sense of God delaying his promise. So here we see again the Lord, and he will often do this, the Lord. He will, he will reassure us. He'll maybe restate the promise to us, but sometimes in a different and in a fresh way, and even provide us with more insights, and it's terrific when that happens. But what I love is the Lord provides an object lesson. When he says, Abram, let's go outside. So, you know, I'm thinking a vision happens at night. So God, through the Spirit, escorts Abram out of his tent. And I just imagine out in that uh, country side of Canaan, there would be all kinds of stars in the sky. And uh, the Lord says to Abraham, uh, now I'd like you to start counting them. Can you just imagine? Abraham gets to 5, to 10, to 15, to 20, and he's going, there's absolutely no way I could count all these stars. And I think of the Lord, and I, I read this in, but I think it's sanctified speculation. I, I, I can see the Lord saying to Abraham, Abraham, if I have the ability to put all these stars in the sky, don't you think I have the ability to come through on the promises I've made to you? You're going to have thousands and thousands of physical descendants and millions of spiritual descendants. Hang in there. I can be trusted. Another aside, I don't know about you, I love the promises and the reassurance we find in Scripture. I love it when it comes to us in song, especially as we sing as a congregation. I, I love the spiritual counsel and advice from friends. But I love getting out into nature. No, I'm not a survivalist, but have you, have you ever had a night where you've just gone out on your own and looked up into the sky and, and seen the stars. What's the old song? Is in the sky or in the stars his handiwork I see? No, it's in, it is in the stars. Do you remember that? He's everything to me. That was, there's an oldie goldie. But the idea of looking into the stars, some of you enjoy camping, maybe till Algonquins. Maybe for some of you it's just being at your cottage on a dark night. But... Just having that moment. No wonder David, who spent a lot of time outside looking into the stars, was able to say, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I think for Abraham in this moment, he experienced that God is great. God is good. And he is fully able to do what he has promised. So you've seen these three Ds, the dread, the doubt, and the delay We've observed this divine reassurance, and we'll conclude with the defining principle. Verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord, and God cre credited it to him as righteousness. Principle. The other night on Jeopardy, I got a question that nobody else got. I, I was very proud of myself. Uh, it was a category called uh, schoolroom terms, and uh, the clue was to do with uh, uh, something of utmost importance. And I guessed the term would be principle. Now, I think what confused the contestants was, you know that there's different spellings, right? A principal in a school, as Heather told me, is your pal. Did you know that? The principal is your pal. That's a way for you to remember it. The principle we're talking about, and a lot of people don't appreciate this meaning, it's especially uh, potent as an adjective, but it means of primary, of utmost importance. And scholars have argued for years that this verse is likely one of the most important verses in the Old Testament, if not into the New Testament. It is so incredibly significant. It's one of the most quoted statements in all of Scripture. And uh, this is so very important. So let's parse it just a little bit. 
it says to us, Abram believed the Lord. Now, I've, I know it can be a bit confusing. I've tried to make a case that Abram already believed the Lord. This is, this is kind of like a rededication, but maybe in a greater sense, it's a summary statement. It's the life principle that describes the spiritual journey of Abraham. He was one who believed the Lord. The Hebrew word here uh, is, is from the root that means amen. Sometimes we think, what does amen really mean? Well, it means to agree, to give assent to. And here we see Abraham as agreeing with what God has said. It's, I'm going to put it this way, it's believing the word of the Lord and believing the Lord of the word. Does that make sense? It's believing the promises of the Lord and believing the Lord of the promises. And this is what we see. And then in the New Testament, the word for believe takes on an extended meaning, a pistos, which at its root means to entrust. So when I think of what it is to believe in the Lord, it's that idea of assent, of agreement, combined with that notion of entrusting your life to, to the Lord himself. And this is what we see with Abraham. And then, really, the payoff. Abraham believed the Lord, and, and this belief, this faith, was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, apart from this belief, our spiritual account is bankrupt. In fact, we have an incredible debt. And, and, and Abraham anticipated the fulfillment of the promise, not knowing in full that it would be Christ, one of his descendants. But Jesus himself would cancel the debt and God would credit your account, my account, all believers' spiritual account with the righteousness of the Lord. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, into the New Testament, in three places, we see a direct quote of Genesis 15 and 6. I just want to turn to one because of our time. So if you've got your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter 4. Homework today would be to read the whole chapter, Romans 4. Uh, it's astounding, the references that uh, are made in Galatians 3 in James 2 to this statement, but in Genesis 3, sorry, John, Romans 4, let's pick it up um, in verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God in a general sense, but was strengthened. This is what we see in Genesis 15. He was strengthened in his faith, faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The... Uh, what enables us to be righteous. And what I love about that text is it's Paul saying, hey, by the way, when God communicated that to Abram, it wasn't just for Abram, it's for you. Uh, I know people who actually identify those last verses of Romans 4 saying, this is for me. Years, years, years ago, this is what written for people like me who put their faith in Jesus. 
Again, the other two passages I would encourage you to look at are Galatians chapter 3 and also then looking into James chapter 2. Final encouragement. I believe from Ephesians 2 we're taught that faith is a gift and God is invested in the strengthening and the progress of your faith. I also want to encourage you that God committed to you is committed to strengthening, to give you the evidence and the persuasion needed to strengthen your faith. Now in closing today, uh, I think it's good for us corporately to, whether it's to say a creed or to sing a creed, but a declaration of our faith as a way of inspiration and encouragement. So Rick and Glenn, I'm going to invite you back to the platform. And just as they're coming, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm just going to pray briefly. God, strengthen our faith even as we sing this song. And may it be a declaration, may it be an affirmation of what we believe. And Father, for any of us who are struggling, have questions or concerns about our faith, may this song be a powerful witness to us. We ask in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, amen.